like many many roboticists, I I draw sort of inspiration, and it sort of like helps create the sort of mental picture of of what's what's possible or sort of what could be. Um, you know, an early uh, I started my lab at MIT in, in 2011, and right from the beginning, sort of an early. Um, inspiration for us was, you know, in the movie sort of Iron Man, sort of the, I don't know if you remember sort of the scene where the robotic assistant is helping uh, sort of a soldering task and is sort of just placing the piece at the right place at the right time, anticipating, you know, uh, you know, the every, every next desire. Um, and, you know, like Jar Jarvis <laughs> does not have an informational sense, but on a physical sense, um, it's equally important. It's equally critical uh, to effective, um, you know, human teamwork in, in sort of shared physical space. Uh, and you know, could we could we get to a point where robots could sort of infer human mental state, anticipate what we would do, how we would move, where we would be reaching, um, and uh, and be able to adapt and respond. And, uh, and it's really an incredible thing, like over the course of the better part of 10 years, like we have made like leaps and bounds towards that. You know, on the flip side, um, systems that, we're, that we interact with on a daily basis, you know, don't have that capability yet. And so um, in, in, there's a statistic, you know, in the US, um, um, there are sort of 30 million robots in people's homes today. Now, like full disclosure, like a lot of them are Roombas. <laughs> okay. It bumps into you, um, and it's okay. It, it 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 functions, you know, appropriately, very well for the job that it's that it's doing. But um, but when we think about um, you know these systems, thirty million robots, they don't make a they don't make an imprint on our public consciousness. Um, and a, a lot of the reason is that they're really doing very narrowly defined tasks in really controlled environments, and essentially under constant human oversight. Um, and so. Um, you know, the challenge is, you know, how we get sort of be better value from these systems. And for that, they need to integrate more deeply into, into our human world. Um, and things that have worked up until now, robots just seeing us as obstacles bouncing off of us, are okay when it's one Roomba in your living room, but are completely unacceptable when it's now dozens of robots that you interact with from when you wake up in the morning, as you move through your house, as you cross the street, as you walk on sidewalks, as you move into your workplace. Hollywood movies are still a really, really excellent inspiration. And then, you know, also, also obviously cautionary tales as well. This kind of goes back to, you know, the Turing test, you know, <laughs> can, you know, like a robot kind of pass for, for a person, um, you know, how, how able is it to do what we expect uh, of a person? Um, and I think, you know, I think that's a less useful way to think about the future role of these robots in, in society, because um, you know, just like any, any, you know, functioning human team, we're not, you're not, we're not just like replicas of each other. We each bring our own unique experiences, our own unique skill sets, humans and machines, humans, AI, and AI or intelligent robots have innately different uh, capabilities. So, you know, one way I like to characterize it is our, what, what is our unique human ability that we bring that, that AI or an intelligent robot cannot? And that's our ability to structure an unstructured problem. Once we've structured an unstructured problem, uh, you know, a machine, whether it's a robot, intelligent robot, can kind of like crush it. Um, but we often underestimate all of the different ways we structure our world um, for, for robots and for AI. Uh, even even deep learning, you know, uh, um, if you think about you know, labeling data that that's used to train these systems, we bring a lot of sort of structure to the problem through uh, our human sort of labeling process. Um, and you know, uh, machine perception, sort of vision, it's um, uh, it's huge, sort of a huge success story. But when you try to take you know object recognition systems, and put them on a robot, on a mobile platform that moves through the environment, they perform very poorly. <laughs> and the reason they perform very poorly is because they're trained on photos that are framed by people. You know, uh, like, like we have a selective attention mechanism for how we take a photo, why we're taking it, what we're, what we're looking at. Uh, but a robot with a camera on it just kind of sweeps through the space without like a human attention mechanism. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, robots are less capable of just even recognizing basic objects in a, in a household environment. The question is, 
you know, not, for me, not how we make uh, robots more capable of, of doing things that people do, but how we take their, their strengths and sort of embed them to empower or enhance human capability. We have this conference in the field, the International Conference on Human-Robot Interaction. And in one of those sort of early um, talks, it just sort of changed the way entirely that I looked at sort of the field of social robots. So uh, on an automotive line, um, according to a study by Harvard Business Review, sort of every minute on an automotive line is like $80,000. Like <laughs> a second is a lot of money. So the, so the business case for introducing a robot, it, like it, half a second can make or break the business case for introducing a robot in that setting. And then I saw this talk at this conference where the whole study was uh, a setup where a person was walking across a room and there was a robot. And in one condition, the robot stared straight ahead while the person walked across the room. And in the other condition, the robot just tracked the person as they moved across the room with sort of like a camera head. That's it. And you know what happens? By putting a robot with a head that just tracks a person moving across the room, a person takes a much longer <laughs> path around that room. Like a person is kind of wary of the system, you know, tracking it through the room. Uh, would a person, you know, you know, deviate in that way if a human was sort of following them? You know, probably not. Um, although maybe to some extent, uh, there's a difference whether you're sort of interacting in, in that social way or not. But for a robot, that that deviation across the room was like an extra second of walking time. That breaks the case, <laughs> the business case for my robot introduced on an automotive line. And so these very subtle decisions that that you make regarding. Uh, not just you know how the robot looks, but but small aspects as to how it behaves. Um, you might be thinking you're making it look more natural by having it you know attend to people that are moving in the space, um, but it can have these sort of um, these these very significant effects on human behavior. Conversely. Uh, you know, one of the issues with autonomous cars is that um, sort of the very social ways that we signal at intersections are kind of taken away from us. The ability to wave someone, say, I see you, or a bike, a biker, um, person on a bicycle sort of coming through an intersection. You'd kind of wave with them, you'd make eye contact to acknowledge them so that they know it's safe for them to move through the intersection. Um, if we don't in explicitly incorporate this into our design of these systems, um, I mean, there are safety implications for that as well. Um, and so I think it's just a, a lesson of how important it is to think about these systems as sort of really embedded in the social fabric.